these notes will focus on what Canada is like today with um, some particular focus on culture and government. Canada and the United States are uh, countries with very similar histories that kind of went about doing the same thing in a different way. Um, England, they were both part of England, and the United States fought against England to get their independence immediately, whereas Canada blow broke away from uh, Britain slowly using politics, which meant that they uh, maintain a much closer friendship and relationship with Britain than USA does. However, when it comes to culture, we know that that big word from the uh, Can Canadian history was compromise, compromise, compromise. And so that really shows in how they deal with other cultures because the United States, remember I talked about it's a melting pot. It's that soup. Um, all of the ingredients get put into the soup. It changes the ingredients and they become part of the soup, but it a little bit changes the flavor of the soup too. Okay, so when... If you're a melting pot, then you're forcing these new cultures to come in and become part of your culture to turn into that. Okay. Whereas Canada is talked about as a cultural mosaic. And a mosaic is a picture that is made up of smaller pieces of art. And so um, the two examples that I have right here on the slide are these pictures that are made up of different pictures. Okay. And so this is what Canada wants as part of their culture. They want to have a true Canadian culture, but they want all these people from different cultures to come in and keep their own identity. So these pictures stay the same, but they all combine to make an idea of what Canadian culture is. So it's a bunch of different pictures coming together to make the big picture that is Canadian um, uh, culture, okay? Um, so Canada is technically a multicultural country, and so that means that they have many, many different cultures put together, um, but all these cultures are, are allowed to be different, and they are also... Um, a bilingual country, which means that they have official languages, but they're, they have two national official languages. They uh, count French and English as their official languages. And so now we need to focus on how the government of Canada functions. Um, and the government of Canada has a queen, and that queen right now is Queen Elizabeth. So the queen of Canada is the same person as the Queen of England, okay? And so Queen of England, Queen of Canada are the exact same person, um, but the Queen, Queen Elizabeth is the head of state, okay? Um, she really doesn't have a whole lot of power besides um, dealing with foreign affairs, how the country deals with other countries, okay? And so being that they have a queen, they are technically, the Canadian government is a monarchy, but it's a special kind of monarchy called a constitutional monarchy. And a constitutional monarchy is when there is a king or a queen, but their powers are very small and they're limited by a constitution. So um, this constitution took away, or takes away most of their power and um, allows them, but allows them to still be kind of as the representative figurehead head of state. Okay. Um, in Canada, they also have a federal system. Remember, a unitary system is one big government. Federal system is where you have a balance of power between federal governments and then smaller governments. And so in America, we call them state governments. But since in Canada, they're not called states, they're called provinces. They are called provincial governments there. So federal government and then provincial governments instead of state governments. Like the United States, Canada's government also has three branches. We're going to talk about two of them here and then one more on the next slide. Um, the legislative branch is the first one we'll talk about. It is Parliament. This is the House of Parliament right here, this picture. Okay. Um, and Parliament is the group that makes laws. And they have a House of Commons and a Senate. And so it's kind of similar to the United States. Uh, the House of Commons are elected by the people. Um, just like our House of Representatives is, but their Senate works a little bit different, okay? Um, the way that their Senate works is the Prime Minister, which is um, part of the House of Commons, um, is 
or appoints, so picks the people that should be in the Senate. They appoint them, and then the senators get to stay in that position until they're 75 years old. Okay. Now, the House of Commons is a different deal because they're elected in, and the leader of the majority party, the party that has the most um, – you know, people in the House of Commons, their leader gets to automatically become the prime minister. And the prime minister is kind of like kind of like the president of Canada, the person with the most power. OK, and so the prime minister has to first become elected into the House of Commons and then they have to become the leader of the majority party. Um, second is the judicial and the judicial branch in the Canadian government is a lot like the United States, pretty much the same setup. They have their federal courts, and then it goes all the way up through appeal courts and up into the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's job is to interpret the laws to make sure that they um, fit with Canada's constitution and then also to apply them to situations where laws need to be applied. All right, so the executive branch of Canada, the strange thing, the different thing than the U.S. is that there's no separation at all between the legislative and the executive branch because every member of the executive branch is also a member of the legislative branch okay and so like i said the prime or like i said before the prime minister first off they have to be a member of the house of commons so they need to be elected into the house of commons then they have to become the leader of their party and their party has to become the majority party in the house of commons um and so what does the prime minister do? The prime minister determines the government policies um, and steers legislation. So decides how the government is essentially going to work and then um, kind of tries to move the lawmakers in the right direction of, of making the government the way the work the way that they envision. And they also get to choose the senators. So they really are the person with the most power in Canada, and they're the closest thing to a president. Remember, there is a queen in Canada, but they really don't have very much power. The most powerful position is the prime minister. Um, the prime minister also selects some other members of the House of Commons to advise them um, to be advisors, and they are called the cabinet, much like the uh, cabinet in the United States. And like I said, that div the thing that makes it different than America, um, the big one is that there's absolutely no separation between the legislative and the uh, executive branch um, in Canada. Uh, continuing on with the executive branch, um, the monarch is, is technically part of the executive branch. Um, and the monarch, like I said, is mainly a ceremonial position. They don't have a whole lot of real power. Um, the Queen of England does not have a ton of power in uh, Canada. However, some of the things that are important, they, they, when they are in Canada, they do some many important ceremonial duties. So um, kind of part of historical type thing and the way that things work. And also all the laws are made in the name of Queen Elizabeth. So when they make new laws, they're technically in the name of the monarch. Okay. Now, the person who does most of the work when the queen is not around uh is the governor general and the governor general is kind of like the queen or king's right hand man the person who does uh most of the work for the monarch and so what the governor general does is they give the monarch's approval to um, bills and actions and all kinds of different stuff the laws and everything they get to have the veto power so they essentially approve the things um, now, there's some rules to being the governor general, which are kind of interesting and kind of show that the culture of compromise that, that they have here there in Canada. And the, one of them is they must be bilingual. They have to be able to speak both French and English. And it alternates. It goes back and forth between a French Canadian person and an English Canadian person. And so... Um, they are when they're elected when they're selected by the monarch i guess not elected but actually picked by the king or the queen um they are picked for five years and one of their major jobs one of the governor general's major power is if the majority is not clear or if a prime minister dies or you don't know who the majority party is or something like that the governor general actually gets to select who the prime minister is out of the house of commons um, if it's not obvious who it should be 
And so the whole idea of the governor general and the executive branch is that it's designed to benefit all citizens, to balance the needs of both the French and the English Canadians. So life in Canada, the economy is uh, really strong in natural resources. And they have many natural resources because they are a very large country. So with a large country, lots of land, there's lots of resources there. Um, they also have great technology. They're number two to the United States in Internet users in the entire world. And that's really kind of weird because they have a pretty small population, but a very high percentage of those people are Internet users. And so they're able to uh, keep that dense designation as the number two country in the world behind the United States. They also have developed their service industry. And remember, a service industry is, is based on doing something for somebody, not making something. And usually um, countries develop into service industries as they um, kind of gain more power and, and become older countries as they kind of grow up, if you think of it that way. Um, they are also, Canada is a very strong country in education. They are number the number one country in the world in the percentage of their citizens that graduate college. So they have the highest percentage of citizens that graduate college. And they also have a 99% literacy rate. And a literacy rate is um, the number of people over seven years old who can read, write, and understand um, written words. And so these people, so in Canada, 99% of the people over seven years old can read, write, and understand written words. So it's an impressive literacy rate. So we'll talk a little bit more about the high quality of life in Canada. Uh, it it's really is a very, very good quality of life. Um, they have a lot of different things going for them. One of them is low unemployment. So uh, most people that want a job in Canada have a job. So not very many people are unemployed looking for work. Um, the second is there's health care for everyone. They have free and provided by the government health care. Um, in Canada. They also have many clean environmental policies as they're trying to work with the United States to help the environment um, as well as protect those fragile lands of the Arctic where they don't repair themselves as quickly as, as the um, warm land around it. And they also have a modern and good transportation system with roads and a train system and, you know, public buses and things like that, um, uh, airports, all this kind of stuff. They have a great system of transportation, uh, much like the one in the United States. So with trade due to NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement that we talked about with the United States, um, they have that same agreement that allows there to be no barriers to trade for Canada or Mexico or the U.S. with all those three countries. Okay, so NAFTA creates a scenario in which one billion dollars in goods are able to cross over the Canada and U.S. border every single day. And so Canada and the United States are each other's most important trading partner. Absolutely 100%. They need each other um, to stay around. And so... Um, the other thing that Canada is a part of is the World Trade Organization, and that is um, reduced trade restrictions for every country that's part of this World Trade Organization, with their, which there's over 100 countries involved in it. And so this also increases their trade around the world. Um, Canada's number one export is their natural resources. And so one third of their economy includes exporting their natural resources, things like oil and lumber, as well as like they export a lot of energy. So a lot of electricity and things like that, that they get off of their hydroelectric, off of their um, dams, and they'll export that electricity across the border into America and sell it to us. And so natural resources are their biggest chunk of their economy, one third of their economy. Canada is also known as a peacekeeper big nation because of their really big involvement in the United Nations. And the United Nations is an organization made up of many different countries that um, has a peacekeeping force. And the UN uh, peacekeepers, their job is to go in, they wear their you know, they're from Canada, they're from England, they're from America, they're soldiers from all these different places, 
and what they do is they go in and they wear these blue helmets to show that they're part of the UN, not part of their own army at that time, and they just stand in between people who are trying to kill each other, or they guard a border, um, they try and stand in the way of something where a war could happen, and so their goal is to avoid war. And when you think about it, that's pretty scary. If you have some huge country that can easily defeat you, um, standing between you and your enemy who you could maybe easily defeat, you're going to be less likely to try and go through that big country because if you attack them, then you start a war with every country in the United Nations and, and this big military is going to swoop through and destroy you. And so the whole idea behind the United Nations is to avoid war. And it was founded by 50 countries, one of them was Canada, after World War II to try and um, keep peace all around the world so that this these big wars wouldn't happen anymore um, one of the Canada is one of their top supporters they are the fourth largest financial supporter even though by population they're one of the smaller countries that are involved in it so they put a lot of money per person into um, the United Nations So the cultural mosaic in Canada allows there to be a great mix of the old and the new, a mix of the indigenous people, the natives, as well as the immigrants, the newest people that have come to the country. Um, it, With the cultural mosaic in mind, Canada has recognized itself as a plural society. And a plural society is a society where the culture ethnic and racial groups are encouraged they're supposed to you that we want them to keep their own identity and keep their own culture um, and so you're not asking them to become canadians you want them to um, still keep their own culture and and add that into the canadian culture and so um canada adopted in the 1970s a policy um, in their uh, one of their laws that they would be a multicultural country okay and so immigration has obviously been very big as these people are allowed to keep their um, keep their identities and so over half right now of the people that are immigrating into Canada are coming from Asia okay and so Asia is really the big continent that is sending people over to Canada at the moment there are many diverse cities in Canada because they're taking in so many cultures. The most diverse city and also the largest city in Canada is Toronto. And Toronto has people from all of these different areas, from Asia, from Africa, from the Caribbean islands, Latin America, um, as well as Euro early European settlers. So that means that from Asia, Africa, South America, and Europe, that's four of the seven continents, um, Toronto has people from all of those and so um, it's really a very diverse city when you think about it because um, more than half of the students there speak a language other than English in their home and so while they're taught in English and maybe also taught in French uh, more than half of them speak something else other than that in home and so um, you know the majority is is not over 50 percent the english speaking majority is not 50 percent so one of the biggest challenges to the culture of canada is america and so what they want to do is be able to maintain canadian culture and not have it just become part of america to the north not have it act the exact same way as america and so what's happening is um that's flowing across the borders and so all the tv all the movies all the music it's so readily available and easily moved with the internet that um all of that stuff is going from the united states into canada and so they they are trying to figure out a way in canada to um, maintain their own culture and have their own uh, movies and TV and all that kind of stuff. And so what happened is uh, the Canadian TV stations, the, there was a law made for them, and they have to have a certain percentage of Canadian content. And so um, what this has done is it's actually opened up uh, Canadian TV has become, or Canadian entertainment industry has become really, really big, and um, they're recognized as one of the better movie and TV making um, countries now because of this law that they created. And so it's it's extremely important to them that with their uh, 
best trading partner and with um, as important as the U.S. is to them that they keep that relationship with the United States. But at the same time as keeping that relationship with the United States, they also need to make sure that they stay themselves as Canada and don't just become just like the United States. Um, and we will watch, uh, as far as the no touching zone goes, wait on that. And we're going to watch a video in class and we'll talk about the no touching zones so that you can finish up your notes tomorrow.